Hello again, I'm Al Horner, and this is Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, we're joined by a brilliant screenwriter as they revisit their first draft of what became a beloved movie. This week, we're delighted to be joined by none other than John Spates, co-writer of movies like the colossal recent sci-fi adaptation Dune and Marvel's Doctor Strange. Today, we're talking with John about the project that launched him into the stratosphere as a screenwriter. Co-written with Lost creator Damon Lindelof, Prometheus is the bold 2012 prequel to the Alien franchise that no one saw coming. It was a philosophical sci-fi horror that subverted all expectations, divided some opinions along the way, and turned John into one of Hollywood's go-to names for science fiction stories that both thrill and provoke. As you'll discover in this episode, the idea of an Alien prequel was kind of sprung on him in a meeting with Ridley Scott. In an instant, he blurted out an idea for an epic that would take the franchise and its mythology in a bold new direction, switching up the series' close-quarter frights and survival tension for freaky androids and existential questions about the gods that made us. In this special 10th anniversary retrospective of the film, John delves into his original draft for the movie, then titled Alien Engineers. It followed roughly the same beats as Prometheus, but with a few notable exceptions. For starters, engineers made the bold move of suggesting that Jesus Christ was an alien and therefore related to the xenomorph of the first Alien movie. It also had a different ending that sets up a planned trilogy of movies with these characters, which John shares with us in detail. It goes without saying, if you have yet to see Prometheus, you might want to hit pause and do so first, because in space, no one can hear you screaming about spoilers. Thanks to John for being an amazing guest, and thank you as ever to our Patreon supporters, a list which includes Marguerite Almario and Ross McTaggart. If you would like to help the show continue to grow, if you'd like to access ad-free episodes, and if you would like to have your questions for future guests answered on air, well, you know what to do. Head to patreon.com forward slash script apart to get involved. We really appreciate your support. Okay, let's get into it. This is the excellent John Spates talking about the first draft secrets of Prometheus. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. John, so great to have you with us. How are you doing today? Uh, Very well. Thanks for having me. (laughs) The pleasure's all mine. Um, John, we're speaking almost a decade on from the release of Prometheus, which of course is the film we're talking about today. It's been a busy 10 years for you since with, you know, the Oscar nomination for Dune recently, almost like bookending that that initial 10 years in your career since that breakout film. How quickly has the time gone for you? Oh, it's just like every decade. They take forever to labor through. There are days that take years. And then you look back at the end of 10 years and you feel the same age you were when you started. And it's hard to believe <laughs> that a decade's gone by. I can imagine. I can imagine. So now we are a decade out from Prometheus. Now the dust has settled and the kind of whirlwind of writing it under what I presume was a massive weight of expectancy. Uh, you know, I'd be curious to hear what your relationship is with the film today, like how often you think about it and how you reflect back on the story that you, Ridley and Damon, were able to tell together. Well, it was a pivotal moment for me career wise. Um, you know, not my first studio assignment, but the first thing of its magnitude by miles, the first thing that put me in the room uh, with a director like Ridley Scott and, um, you know, momentarily at the helm of a colossal IP franchise like the Alien universe. Uh, and so that way it was completely transformative. Um, and in other ways, it was, you know, one more story to tell back to back in a long screenwriting career, which are always like icebergs, you know, which is to say that I've, what, I've gotten six movies made now and I've probably written 24 and or more i don't know i haven't counted actually uh, but you you write so much more than anyone knows you've written at the end of the day uh, that the adventure is much bigger for you than it is for others but yeah prometheus was a massive a gateway for me really into a, a higher level of the game yeah and it, it's curious like one of my favorite things about this movie it's kind of sense of defiance i mean it's in the lifeblood of this series to kind of switch up genres and surprise fans like Aliens was a very action-centered left turn compared to the lean contained horror of the first film. And, you know, Prometheus at the top of a decade that would be defined by these franchises kind of attempting to rebottle and retread 
the feel and story of the original movies that spawned them. Instead, Prometheus was was another left turn and it was this big philosophical treatise on like man and its maker, our proclivity towards mythology and all these different things. It operated at a wholly different speed to the other Alien movies before it. Was that something you kind of like aspired to from the start with Ridley or, you know, did the material just demand it? How did you end up switching lanes and kind of making a different type of Alien movie? There are a couple of pieces to that. Uh, the first piece is, I think, intrinsic to the premise. And it was called out by, or called forth by the, the nature of my way in. I took a general meeting over at Scott Free, Ridley's company, and they were doing the usual general meeting stuff. They're shoving comic books and short stories across the table at me, trying to see if there's anything that sparks my interest and you know, my response in those moments is always like, well, you know, I love your comic books and your short stories, but why don't you tell me what kind of story you'd like to tell and I'll write you a fresh one. I'll get you an original. Um, and so I was playing that game at the end of the meeting. They, was, they said, well, you know, we, we were thinking about going back to Alien. And I think by that time, there had always already been Aliens 1 through 4. So that franchise felt pretty played out to me. Like uh, Ripley, rather, was good and dead. And it felt like they played an enormous number of notes. And, and, and I think the, there had been a skid in quality from one and two to the subsequent sequels. And so it felt like dangerous territory to keep going forward. I said, the only way you could go, I think, would be backward. And they said, we were thinking the same thing. Uh, we're looking at a prequel. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? And that was interesting because I hadn't prepared anything for that or contemplated the question of an alien prequel previously. But the question was instantly fertilizing for me. I guess a few things jumped instantly out at me. Before Alien, that original installment, there is nothing. There is a wrecked alien ship with a giant cadaver in it and a hold full of alien eggs on a remote moon that has not yet, to our knowledge, played a role in the human story. And so what does that mean? The space jockeys, these big aliens who are lying dead in the ship, are colossal elephantine beasts. It seemed impossible to me to imagine an audience, certainly a, a mainstream audience, uh, getting down with a giant movie about 14 foot tall elephant monsters on another planet speaking an alien language, subtitles everywhere. <laughs> so the only way to tell a story about the space jockeys prior to Alien is that their story prior to their discovery of that ship is somehow also our story. And if the space jockey story is the human story, then on the scales we're talking about in time and space, uh, they would have to be playing a role in human history. And that makes them suddenly the Von Daniken style aliens, um, the meddlers in human evolution and in human development, the beings from outer space who might have helped to build the pyramids. It, it taps instantly into a whole vein of modern mythology. Uh, that essentially knits primal fascinations of early religion and folklore to our present day sense of the unknown. And that's what these sort of aliens as helpers do to us. They kind of create an Ur mythology that stretches from the boundaries our, of our knowledge now, where our God of the gaps lives, and uh, all the way back to Mount Olympus and gods of death and dreams. Um, from early history. Uh, so instantly fully, fully formed came this notion that here were our creators. And follow-up question, why then are they in a ship filled with deadly human parasites? And why, parenthetically, uh, does the xenomorph seem to be perfectly adapted to kill human beings when it clearly didn't involve where human beings were? It's capable of pupating inside a human body, uh, it's compatible with our chemistry. Even its gross invasive proboscis is, is, <laughs> is perfectly matched to our anatomy, like a hummingbird's bill to a flower. And how could that be? And the answer was, well, it's because these alien gods made them to kill us. And why? And that was the seed of the story. I sort of jumped in and started telling it. Um, and... In the space of half an hour, I'd sketched out what remain most of the major movements of the film that was shot. Yeah, yeah wow. So when you say instantly, you mean quite literally in the room w when you were put on the spot, basically. 
Yeah, a lot of embellishments came later, uh, but the the live pitch had all of the major movements in it. There's a sense of culmination when you go back and watch Prometheus, having read the work you had done prior to that. There's a lot of little elements that you were able to kind of carry over from Shadow 19 and from your Passengers screenplays. So Passengers obviously has those medical pods and the idea of someone watching over someone in a state of hypersleep, right. that makes a, an appearance in Prometheus. And of course, the name Prometheus, that had a presence in Shadow 19, which I should explain for listeners is, you know, that was a, that was kind of your breakthrough script, right, John? That was something you sold. the first screenplay I ever wrote, actually. It was at the time a fantastically expensive film to contemplate, <laughs> um, but it's a far future shoot 'em up where heavily armored space Marines tangle with alien life from sort of a hell world. But that was part of a terraforming effort. And the terraforming effort was built around a machine named Prometheus. Yes. Yeah. So the name obviously had a resonance and you would kind of gravitate towards that word before it became the title of this movie, but it wasn't the original title. Am I right in thinking you were originally working under the name Aliens, uh, sorry, Alien Engineers. That was the, the title of the first script as you had it, John. That's right. Yeah, Alien colon Engineers. That's right. Yeah. So what was the kind of journey towards uh, it becoming known as Prometheus? I think at one point Damon had it titled as Paradise, just on its own without any kind of alien attachment. What was the journey towards that name Prometheus and, and what does it mean to you? Well, part of it happened when I wasn't looking. Wayland's ship that finds the juggernaut in Prometheus was called Magellan in my drafts. And so it was the Magellan that went and, and uh, got into trouble in this alien world. My script delved somewhat deeper into the mythological and biblical ramifications of the discovery of the engineers. There's all kinds of fantastic stuff in the Old Testament about the Nephilim, uh, the sort of giants who dwelt among humanity um, in the early pages of the Bible, were powerful, were teachers, and sired children with humanity uh, to create a, a, a breed of more angelic or more noble beings who were leaders among us. So that seemed very fertile mythology for our alien story. Um, and then, of course, in Greek mythology, the Titans loomed large. And in particular, Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods to bring it to people, seemed like a very relevant touchstone for us mythologically. So in my script, there was more biblical quotation and more direct conversation about ancient mythology. And Prometheus was specifically discussed uh, as uh, an archetype for these alien engineers who guided humanity forward in its evolution. So sometime after I was on the thing, when, uh, during on Damon's watch, I think the Magellan was renamed Prometheus and uh, the title of the film shifted. Part of that also was about uh, a kind of change of heart on the part of the studio about positioning the movie as an alien property. Uh, so, they originally set out to make a prequel to Alien um, and noised it about in the press that they were doing a prequel to Alien and they were excited about it. And then at some point, some of the top brass, I think Inception came out just then. And big original movie made a huge splash. And I think some of the top brass went and saw that movie and said, man, look at this. This is original, an original film driving cinema audiences mad in their seats. And what are we doing? We're making one more sequel and prequel. Um, one more franchise film. And so some shiny thinker had the idea that there were enough original ideas in this alien prequel that maybe you just call it an original movie. So they wanted to reposition a little bit, just I think because they felt the cultural moment was calling for original stuff because Inception just happened. It felt like a gauntlet thrown down. And so more for business than creative reasons, they got interested in thinking about the movie more as an original. And it was retitled for that reason. And a couple of other pivotal changes were made. That's interesting. And man, you're not kidding about the uh, the biblical elements of your draft. Like there's a sort of throwaway line about an hour in, 57 pages. Holloway says, something killed them off back around the time of Christ. Maybe he was one of them, a great teacher sent from heaven, Jesus, the last engineer. And it's a bit of a throwaway line that Shaw, or Watts as she's known in this draft, kind of laughs off. But 
it did make me kind of like wonder if there was ever a moment kind of during the evolution where you were working in even more biblical material or you were leaning in even harder on the idea that Jesus was an engineer and that all Christianity mythology kind of stemmed from there. Was there a moment at all before you kind of came to do this draft where you were going even harder on the biblical elements? Now that's that's the deep water mark right there. And that line specifically is Ridley. Um, oh, really? Right. I spent a ton of time with Ridley working up that script, which was a nonstop delight. And that was a thing that came to him almost exactly as it comes to the character in that scene. He, bless his heart, would have, every time we met, he'd have this beautiful silver tray brought in with this china pot full of great coffee and like a plate of English shortbread. So I did not get skinnier <laughs> making this movie, but I was very happy all the time. And we would sit there eating cookies and drinking this very good coffee and riffing about story and parasitic insects and ancient mythology and just everything that dovetails with what we're up to. Um, and it was one of those moments where he's like, oh, maybe Jesus was one of them. He cackled and drank his coffee. <laughs> and I just love the idea, that blasphemous notion that maybe Jesus was the scion of some giant alien. Um, so it felt like the only non-incendiary way to insert that idea would be <laughs> in the same throwaway and jocular mode, which was pitched in the room to let it be a throwaway joke. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was Ridley's bit. In terms of the elements that you knew you had to play with, in terms of solving some of the mysteries that had kind of surrounded this franchise for years, what did you have to play with? Obviously, there was the kind of pilot that we mentioned, kind of the Elephantine pilot glimpsed in the first movie. What were some of the starting points for you in terms of brainstorming fun ways to answer these decades long mysteries that had amassed around around the earlier films? We have the furniture of of the first film, which is the crashed ship that I named the Juggernaut and that alien of the pilot's cradle who had been nicknamed in lore for a long time, the space jockey. And around the space jockey and the design of that ship, the geagerness of it raises a host of other questions because the xenomorph itself, the alien predator, looks like the ship it was born in. The ship, in a sense, presents itself as an extension of xenomorph biology. It has the same uh, repetitive units, the same chitinous carapace look to it, the same black sheen. So in the Giger-fueled design of that original alien movie, the interior of the juggernaut, which extends to the xenomorph itself, to the walls and bulkheads of the ship, and to the cradle in which the space jockey sits and the space jockey himself who appears to have fused with what looks like in many ways vintage pilot gear so he's a kind of an elephantine monster but it looks very much like he's wearing a world war ii combat helmet with the breath mask and the breathing tube but it's all fused with his body and part and parcel of him so that is a great riddle in and of itself what does it mean that here is a place where there is a kind of unitary technology that fuses biology with machinery and extends all the way up and down through everything we meet inside this space. So it implies a, a different technology. And it also implies that the makers of the ship are the pilots of the ship. And the makers of the ship are also the makers of the xenomorphs. So it's not just a case of some particularly nasty tribal like infection of this alien star cruiser, it seems to me from their placement and from the design of the xenomorphs when they emerge that the only logical explanation uh, is that they were an intentional cargo of this vessel and that they have a common maker. That's interesting. So did in your early discussions with Ridley, did he kind of, uh, yeah, give you any insight into when he planted that in the first film originally, did he have any kind of mythology or was it just like, this seems kind of like a nice thing to plant in here as something that would allude to a greater story around this? Like, what information was given to you from him in terms of like the original placement of the space jockey? I think not very much. He was looking for design cues uh, in his very early process. He came upon Giger and a number of elements uh, in the film from the space jockey himself or itself to the xenomorph to various elements of ship design were lifted part and parcel from that book and you know given Ridley's spin and integrated by him 
But I think he just found deeply alien design scheme and aesthetic infused with gothic horror, but an almost biological alienness, you know, like deep sea organisms fused with human nightmares. And it's often the case, I think, in filmmaking. It's a very interesting thing about the interaction of filmmakers and fans. A filmmaker needs a world behind the foreground action and will often suggest that world with some throwaway lines, with some decor in the background, with a transition. These things operate in various ways, like matte paintings in classic film. But they also share very often the quality of matte paintings in that they are paper thin and of low resolution. <laughs> and you're not meant to walk up to them and put your nose six inches from the canvas and interrogate that thing. <laughs> Sometimes there's a filmmaker who will go deep like a Dungeons and Dragons player and you know build a mythological universe behind the action. But much more often in my experience, filmmakers think up as much as they need to to tell their story. And everything beyond the ragged border of that zone quickly fades to gray. What happens a lot when a franchise becomes successful, everyone goes looking for how to do more in that space. And there are all these bits and bobs on the map painting that attract attention. And some of them might support the weight of further story, but many <laughs> of them I think will not. I think many of them are fairly thin. I mean, a great example is Star Wars, you meet Ben Kenobi, he's like, oh, I fought with your father during the Clone Wars. And like, that's a rad thing to say to somebody that you fought with their dad during the Clone Wars. You don't even know what that means. <laughs> Who's cloning what? What's a clit? But it sounds cool. It is good map painting. But then you have to go invent a Clone War and make it interesting. And did they succeed in that? I'll leave that question to the audience. But um, I don't think it's the most fertile story seed. Map painting is thin. Um, the interesting thing about this instance is that it was me being called to do a thing that I'm generally skeptical of, which is to go take a map painting detail like this and elaborate on it until it's a story in its own right. And it worked, in my opinion, only because it dovetailed so neatly with so much deep mythology already present and alive in the hearts and minds of people around the world because we do wonder where we come from. We do wonder how the wonders of ancient civilizations were accomplished. We do wonder about our kinship here with what might be out there. And of course, there are provocative questions raised in that first alien film that can resonate when connected with those ancient questions. And that relationship between, yeah, the fans and the text, like what did that translate to in terms of, you know, being someone with a lot of buzz around you as kind of an emerging screenwriter, but nothing yet on screen, I don't think at this point, did you feel that weight? How daunted were you by, by the task in front of you, John? It didn't feel harder or more problematic than any other kind of storytelling. I was excited about my ideas. Honestly, the thing I'd stumbled into as a premise felt so good to me as an engine for a story that I felt very confident of the prospects for it. It was more about the business context for it all and how that changed the work. One piece was how fast this thing took off. It was something Ridley had been noodling around for years. I mean, you know, everybody took a, a meeting about maybe another alien movie. But at the end of this meeting, the exec I was talking to got very excited and asked me if I would write up, because I didn't even pitch the first thing to Ridley. I pitched it to one of his guys. And the exec I talked to got very excited and asked if I would write that down um, for Ridley, which you're not supposed to do. You don't write down your story and give it as a leave behind for the executives. So they go hire somebody else to write it. But it's Ridley and it's alien. So, yes, I did it. And I, I wrote it up as quick as I could go and I sent it in. And that thing went straight to Ridley and then shot upstairs. And in barely a week, I was sitting in front of a bunch of top brass at the studio. And they were saying, you came up with this kind of immediately. We'd sort of like to hit a release window with a movie like this. Ridley's got a window to make this. How fast can you write this? And they basically asked me in the room if I could get them a draft of this like five and a half weeks later. <laughs> and I said, the only thing you can say in that room is, yes, of course. Of course I can do that. <laughs> and then I walked out of the room and, you know, had a minor heart attack. 
Sure. So the first draft of this thing was written with desperate speed and it got done in a little under six weeks. Uh, so that was the first way in which I was aware of it as a different kind of property because suddenly there was this rocket engine under it. And then the other thing was just the fan appetite for even the faintest inkling of what this project might be about. So this was the first thing I worked on that was locked down from end to end. You know, things had passwords, things were legible only in self-destructing timed electronic <laughs> archives, you know, signing various oaths, never to speak a word of this to anyone or surrender my firstborn child. So the, the and, and, just, and the internet, once they knew that Ridley was going to do it, was ravenous and buzzing and people were poking at me online. And so I just feel a hunger for it. And mm. there's just that knowledge that if I were to leave my notebook in a cafe by accident, I could cause an international incident. Um, <laughs> so in those ways, it was different. But as storytelling, it was like any other storytelling. And, you know, you've kind of like touched on it uh, already in our conversation about you seem someone who like story wise, you know, there's a logical process in which you're like, this is the starting point. So therefore you can extrapolate this. What would someone do in that situation? Extrapolate, extrapolate, extrapolate. There's a quote I like from you uh, about how sometimes your, your approach to writing is sometimes I'll start with a concept, sometimes with characters and sometimes with a seminal image. Um, so it varies from project to project, you've said, but, you know, in general, you begin with character and that character's nature or fate will call a conflict out of the ether. If you start with a predicament, it will invoke generally the sort of protagonist you want to invoke in that sort of predicament. So how did that play out in terms of Prometheus? Who was Shaw or Watts as she's known in this draft? And how did you begin to build her out from the predicament she was going to face in this movie? There were several pieces to that. One was that we were going back to the well in the alien universe. And there've been a number of these movies already. And so two things are true. One is that there is some furniture in that universe that is essentially intrinsic. I think in an alien movie, you want to feel a malevolent corporate presence. Yeah. And the pressure of corrupted human morality seeking power and wealth. One of the reasons the original Alien did so well is that it juxtaposed a woman in jeopardy with her opposite. You have a frail human body, uh, a captain trying to save her crew and keep them alive, a kind of mother figure to this population. And then opposed to that, you have a kind of prototypically male and very rapey alien design that inserts a proboscis into you and impregnates you with its spawn. It is hard shelled, armored, impervious. Uh, its exterior tells no tales. And so in that way, the beauty and the beast of alien felt to me like an essential dynamic. And it felt like that female protagonist was deeply built into the fabric of this storytelling universe. But you didn't just want alternative Ripley to walk into the story. So the question, how do you make that different? There was one thing that I felt we'd never seen, uh, which was a couple, like an active romance, people who loved each other moving into one of these films. You tended to get essentially military configurations of people, people brought together by a mission, a military unit, a prison sentence, shoved together by circumstance and without strong emotional bonds. And so I thought it would be interesting to go the other way and to find people who loved each other and put them in the way of this menace. And that in particular would allow you to play a cool trick where you meet this couple and at the top, it feels like the man is a bit more the protagonist. And then in midstream, you take him out and she becomes the protagonist and, and carries the full weight of the story from there. And so those are, again, predicaments. And what protagonist do those predicaments call? Well, if you're going to play the game where the male gets taken out and the female then has to shoulder the full weight of what had been a dual protagonist before, well, then you want her to feel more junior. You want her to be younger. Um, maybe she's actually a former student of this professor type fella. And so it feels like more of a difficult step up for her to pick up the whole weight of his genius. You want to put him on a pedestal so that losing him feels like more of a loss. 
And so you build a slightly asymmetrical relationship with a luminary leader and a former student who is a genius in her own right, but as yet unfulfilled in her gifts. Um, and you set up a tension that will be rewarded by the predicament you throw her into. Yeah, it seems like so much of her personality ladders up to sort of the key theme or themes of the film. Like she's struggling to become a mother and that speaks to the kind of creation story at the heart of Prometheus. And, you know, she obviously has like a relationship with the concept of faith as well. So there's a lot of interesting things going on there. There's also a lot to discuss in the opening scene to this movie, which has been interpreted in a multitude of ways. And in your first draft, it's pretty much exactly as we see it on screen, give or take a few things. In in your first draft, you talk about these black scarabs boiling out of the dark material of uh, the cake, I believe you describe it as, mm -hmm. the engineer eats. There's an ambiguity to that scene. And I think it's impossible to watch this movie and to not be immediately drawn in by the mystery of that opening. As I mentioned, it's been interpreted in a multitude of ways. Can you talk to me a little bit about your intentions with, with that scene and, and why it was you thought it's important to start the story here rather than leaping in straight away with Holloway and Shaw? Part of it is simply that we're asking the audience to take such a big leap with us. We begin with Holloway and Shaw in archaeologist mode and spinning tales of what might have happened a long time ago. We're giving the audience pure abstraction to incubate in their minds as they carry on with the story. And because you want to do a long drum roll, you're not going to go and walk into an alien ship in the first act of the film. You need to get there. You need to feel the length of the journey. You need to feel the difficulty of getting there, its remoteness. Um, and so it becomes a long time before you make sensory contact uh, with these things. And I'm not, I don't think it's, impossible to tell a story that plays that way. But I think it profited us to glimpse these beings in advance and know that there was some great mystical discovery to be made so that when we finally uncase the head of a space jockey and the helmet peels away, we see that face, it's with a shock of recognition. Another kind of thing that leapt out at me from this first draft was the, so obviously we're introduced to our main characters and they discover another star map in an ancient cave. I think in your draft, they actually discover it in an underwater cave and uh, that became the Isle of Skye in the finished film. O originally, you had the expedition that they go on. Uh, they visit a different planet, right? They in, in, in Engineers, we're touching down on the same planet that the uh, the Nostromo touches down on in in Alien, and that uh, yeah, that that is the sort of center of the action in Aliens as well. So, yeah, do you uh, do you think did it change to kind of expand the universe and give us kind of a new place and vis new visual textures to explore within the Alien mythology, or or why did we sort of switch from from that original plan to uh, to revisit that planet that we'd seen in previous films? It's a good question. We went back and forth a lot over the course of things as to whether or not this was the precise juggernaut of the original film. And some of this is just pure pragmatism in the same way that there was a great or undersea archaeology scene at the top of my film with bath escapes and a sunken monument, and they raised the scan up on the deck of a ship. And it was a very sexy and fun way to start the story. And it was just too expensive, as given everything else we were doing. And like that <laughs> got cut because it cost too much to shoot. And you wanted to save your money for the extraterrestrial stuff rather than stuff down here on Earth. When it came to the exact identity of the world, Ridley and I talked about a possible trilogy of movies that ran as precursors to Alien. And we had a rough sketch of how those things would play. But there was a purely pragmatic and worldly uncertainty about whether or not all those movies would ever get made. And so we were also talking about leaving ourselves escape hatches, meaning that if it started to feel down the road, like we were one and done on this prequel thing, that it would be enough. So that it, we were consciously developing a story as long as we could that left us with an out, a fork in the road, um, such that Prometheus could lead directly to Alien or Prometheus could lead to a branch path and there would be another story that would play in the interstice between Prometheus and Alien and give us more time on this way station moon. 
That's interesting. And I definitely want to come back to the sort of trilogy of films that were originally kind of, you know, conceived, sketched out loosely. But before we do, I need to ask about David, who is, he's such a fascinating character that there are entire kind of fan edits of both Prometheus and Alien Covenant that kind of knit together all his scenes to essentially tell the same story from his perspective. He is this kind of uh, Pinocchio-like character wrestling quietly in the backdrop with a similar question propelling our, our human characters. Who made me and what does it mean to be disillusioned with my makers or to discover that they're flawed and they're destructive? He becomes this kind of agent of chaos in the film. He kind of poisons Holloway and he begins the eruption of violence that takes place on board the Prometheus. How did David come about, John? And, and what did you see as driving him as he makes the choices he does in the film? He feels more nakedly sinister in your draft. So I'm curious to know about the sort of development of this character, why you felt the film needed him and yeah, sort of how you kind of fine tuned that character based on what the movie needed. Well, I would say that in terms of the the mythic furniture of the alien franchise, just as much as you need a sinister corporation and a female protagonist, you've got to have an Android and the Android has to be complex. And part of my concept for David, and he was named according to what I think was an accidental progression, but you've got Ash, Bishop, Call, ABC, D for David. Oh, um, no way. But David also for the prototype of the engineers themselves, uh, who was imagined as sort of Michelangelo's David given life. So that connects him as well. But he's also um, a, a biblical figure. And so in many ways, David had resonances as a name. Part of my concept with David was that he was a more primitive version of the androids that we would meet later in Ash and Bishop. The notion being that he was less convincingly human, um, which gave him a slightly more alien and possibly sinister aspect and was also supposed to be a bit of an uncanny valley. Although there again, pragmatism intervenes because to make an android who looks exactly like a person is free, but to make an android who doesn't quite look like a person is complex and expensive. <laughs> um, and so in the end, David looked exactly like a person, but his dissatisfaction was essential. The idea of his disdain for the humans who made him, who were in some ways lesser creatures, who were weak and needed sleep and could not hold as much in their minds as he can hold. For him, he's like a, a sad foster child dreaming of his real mom and dad. And then along come the engineers, greater beings of vastly more expansive power and ambition and heritage. And he thinks, there's my real mom and dad. That's where I belong. Um, and so like a kid, he builds a fantasy life around this place where he really belongs um, and allows that fantasy to lead him horrifically astray. And in your draft, David finds a hatchery under the pyramid, as it's called, where instead of urns with black goo, the engineers were kind of engineering these creatures who were designed to kill humans and they planned to take them to earth, but they made their creations too well and these creatures ultimately turned on them and killed them. There's an ambiguity left around why the engineers were doing some of these things. So just to unpack a few of the questions, first of all, like how did you land on this idea that ultimately this was a movie that was going to be about meeting our maker and discovering that they weren't some benevolent god, but kind of like a legion of warmongers in a way? And uh yeah, was there anything you wanted to express about man's proclivity to war and violence in that? Because it's so bleak, but it would also explain a lot about the history of mankind uh, that, you know, our makers would have their own violent tendencies. Well, built into um, the premise of Prometheus is an implied schism among the engineers themselves. If they've played the role that Holloway is certain they have, then they have been meddling very intimately with human development, both biologically and culturally for eons. And they have, by implication, molded us into their own image. Our faces look like theirs. Their faces don't look like ours. They were first. They bent humanity toward themselves. It was a hubristic project. And yet here is this death ship and here is its navigation system aimed at earth with this harbor of perfect predators 
of such a design that they could ravage our planet, killing only human beings and leaving the rest of the biosphere intact and essentially erase the engineer's project perfectly. Well, why? That's very interesting. And one argument might be that they, like laboratory scientists, had concluded some experiment. And just like laboratory scientists who calmly decapitate the white mice that they've been meddling with for months to study their brains, they're ready uh, to wrap their experiment up in a tidy manner. But I and Ridley were more excited about the prospect that there actually was faction among these people. And that there was among the engineers a Prometheus-like figure who was excited about the notion of elevating a more primitive species uh, to essentially take the engineer's place. And part of our idea for that was that the engineers as a species were approaching a moment of transition, a childhood end like leveling up, perhaps out of the physical plane and into a more energetic sphere, uh, or perhaps out of this universe and into another that they've played all the games that they can play in this big sandbox and they're headed for greener pastures. And the Prometheus wanted to bequeath the universe they left behind to inheritors and inheritors, uh, not just of some of the technology and some of the culture, but even of some of the, the DNA of the engineers themselves. Um, but on the other side of this schism, there are abolitionists among the engineers who find this experiment blasphemous and profane and released beneath the dignity of their species. And that's a nice cold spring that can create conflict and consequence in subsequent installations of the story. Uh, the notion that there are sympathetic and unsympathetic engineers to the human project. Wow. So it does sound like you had a lot of this mapped out for the subsequent movies. Like how much detail did you know in terms of where it could possibly go? Did you get as far as outlines for those movies? Uh, not as not as far as multi-page outlines for those movies. I think it usually pays to stay loose as you're writing a first installment. Stay loose about second installments because things will emerge for you, and you shouldn't pretend that you know where you're going from the beginning uh, because you'll find that you're wrong. <laughs> um, but we did know that there was a war among the engineers, like a war in heaven, um, and that there would be good angels and bad angels uh, that we would encounter. Wayland Yutani being just Wayland was premeditated, and we had plans for Yutani. And the second film was going to be more uh, a conflict between human factions in the space of this way station moon. So Yutani was going to show up and have very different agenda and very different wants. And there was room to play a kind of Miller's Crossing man in the middle story with Shaw playing dice between them. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's... Yeah. I very definitely left David and Shaw, who was then Watts. <laughs> uh, I named Watts Watts because it was my girlfriend's name at the time, now my wife. Oh, wow. But I didn't realize that one of the executives on the project was going to be Emma Watts, who was a very senior Hollywood exec. And so there was her name in the script and all kinds of terrible things are happening to this poor woman uh, and like Ridley be taking meetings to get confused between the Wattses and like he'd throw Emma into a, into a pitch for a scene and she did not like. And so that, that, <laughs> that name went away. Sorry, wife. Um, and so Shaw it was. So yes, yeah, Shaw was in a position to be uh, this kind of uh, figure in the middle of two rival uh, kind of samurai clans on that way station moon in the next film in my mind. Wow, that's so interesting and also kind of tragic because I would have really liked to have seen those films. Um, we should talk, John, about the ending though. Um, I guess the, the payoff for a movie like this always had to be seeing how the xenomorph was spawned. Um, there are a few different details though in terms of how we arrive at that point. Peter Wayland is introduced in the beginning of your script but doesn't return to have a, a role in the final act here. There's also a few changes in terms of the character ultimately played by Idris Elba, who in the finished movie sacrifices himself and his crew to stop the, the alien craft from leaving the planet. It plays out kind of differently in, in your version. Um, ulti ultimately, though, we, we do arrive at that same place of the engineer giving birth to this terrifying creature, the Ultramorph. 
Can you talk me through uh, yeah, your approach to this final act and some of the changes that it underwent? Well, telling the just-so story of the space jockey, which that would have been, because you see the pilot of the juggernaut unite with his pilot seat. He essentially becomes a living, a living space jockey, and he puts on his suit and acquires the appearance of that creature we meet dead in Alien. We also come to realize that the reason he was in the engineer's version of Cold Sleep when we meet him, uh, which is that he was infected. And he may or may not have known that about himself, but having been awakened and having no way back, he tries to get home. So preserving that fork we were preserving such that if we only got to wait, make one movie, this would still be a, a, a furnishable uh, precursor to Alien. It would serve as a standalone prequel. The idea of crashing the juggernaut and killing the pilot and creating the circumstances that Ripley and her crew discover, however many years later, was very provocative. But it still left the door open for adventures ongoing, meaning that we still imagined another couple of movies playing out with the second one very much beginning, at least, and playing out for much of its story uh, on the same desolate moon, but under very different circumstances. So that is such, such a, as you say, a provocative ending. And um, as we talked about at the top of the episode, it sort of began this decade for you that was going to sort of professionally end with Dune. And, you know, this Oscar nomination, which is so well deserved. You know, there aren't many writers, there aren't any writers, in fact, who've been able to play in as many kind of great sci-fi sandboxes. So you've done Marvel, you've done Dune, you've done Alien. As science fiction playgrounds to be made a custodian of, there's only really one missing, Star Wars. When you kind of look to the future and look to your next decade, what are the kind of things you'd love to kind of work on? Would Star Wars be one of them? And, and if so, is there a particular area of that universe that you'd love to play in? What's kind of like the next chapter look, looking like in terms of your aspirations, John? It's funny. I took a meeting with the Star Wars kids a couple of years back. They asked me what I wanted to do. My hip shot there was, well, I'd be really interested in what it's like to be a stormtrooper raised under totalitarianism and to try to, and to wake up from it and try to break away. Uh, and they kind of got a funny look on their faces like, oh, you can't you can't do that's a good idea. But no, you can't do that because they were already doing it. Yeah, um, I think they left money on the table there in terms of what that experience is actually life. And I'm still curious about it. I love that universe. I grew up in it like, you know, anybody my age and would love to play in it. And I'd be most interested in finding a way to branch off from the Ur myth that they've been retelling in that sort of central story, the kind of Rebel Empire Death Star trinary, um, and find something new. But the, the great thing is there's something new in every direction. I mean, there are so many organs in that universe that have the complexity to be sorry seeds of their own. It would be hard to know where to start, honestly. <laughs> so what is, uh, apart from Dune Part 2, which it sounds like you're working on, just finally, John, what is coming up from you? I know that The Forever War is something you've been kind of uh, attached to for a while. I love that book. So I'm hoping you might have some news there. Is there anything else coming up that people should be excited about? I love Forever War. I'm very happy with the adaptation I did. I don't have news on it, except that my hope springs eternal. Um, <laughs> and I very much hope that someday we'll get to see that film realized in a way that lives up to the novel that spawned it. Just wrote a sci-fi epic called Exodus for a young director named Grant Spatore, which I love. And that's our brand new baby. So we're very excited about that right now. Uh, I'm entering a collaboration with Park Chan-wook uh, based around an adaptation that I can't talk too much about yet. It's all very hush hush, but an extraordinary story. And, you know, one of the living great filmmakers. And that's very thrilling. And ultimately, um, going forward, the great dream is, of course, to not play in one of these great sci fi universes, but to conceive one. So I'm not done with Shadow 19 and I've got other things uh, in my little bag of tricks that I'm hoping uh, to move forward with as originals and maybe give birth to a universe that future writers get to play. That's really exciting. Um, well, John, this has been so much fun. I should let you go, man. But thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for this movie. And uh, yeah, hope to have you back on Script Apart soon. Well, thank you. A real pleasure. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, Produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.